Okay, 7 p.m. So we'll start the meeting for planning, transport, regeneration, ONS committee. And um, as the chair and vice chair said, their apologies. We have to do nominations for a chair. So would members like to nominate someone? Uh, I nominate Dan. Yeah, second that. Yes. Yeah. Or, um, any other nomination? All in favour? Good evening, everybody. I am Councillor Don Snell. I'm the nominated chair for tonight's uh, meeting. As this meeting has been held at Southampton College instead of the Chamber, there is a time limit for the use of this venue, which is until 9.30 p.m. If the items on the agenda are not concluded by 9.30 p.m., we will adjourn the meeting and recommend at the next meeting. Um, apologies for absence. Grace, do we have some apologies? We need just um, Councillor Anderson and Councillor Van Zandt. Item two, minutes. I move that the minutes of the PTR INS committee meeting held on the 7th of December 2021 be approved as a correct record. Are there any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? Yeah. No, okay. Minutes are approved. Item three, urgent business. I've not agreed to any items of urgent business because I think that will do with about. Half an hour ago. <laughs> However, we have had sight of the thorough transport strategy and vision tram active travel and river connectivity briefing note that was circulated on 21st of January. Can members confirm or have received and read this briefing note? The speaker, Dan Lindner. Yeah, thank you. Um, item four, declarations of interest. Does anyone have any declarations of interest? No. I'm going to declare an address, Chair. Uh, I'm the Chair. Um, uh, I own and drive a car in Thurrock, and as a lot of this agenda seems to be to do with driving and parking and the like, I think I was declared that. Uh, and I also live in a, a area as well, so it could be pertinent. Okay, item five uh, fees and charges pricing strategy 2022 to 23. On pages 9 to 42 of the minutes, can I ask Lee Nicholson to introduce your report? Thank you, Jack. Good evening, members. Um, so, this paper sets out the uh, fees and charges pricing strategy for 22 23. Um, of all of the services in the remit of this particular uh, committee, um, just draw members' attention to page 21, um, which is essentially where the main bulk of the report sits. Um, Chair, there's a number of Services covered, um, the number of service leads on the call in the room, um, in case you have any specific queries about anything. Otherwise, we have two recommendations on page nine and ten, um, uh, which essentially is to note the, the changes and also to uh, note directly delegated authority to sort um, by cabinet to allow any changes to the uh, special requirement. Um, Chair, have you? Thank you. Uh, does any member have any questions? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for this report. And it kind of carries on from the last meeting we had. So just, um, I, I was the last person to speak before the technical difficulties came in. So um, I'm, I'm just going back to the minutes on page six. I, I was bringing up, just before the connection went, I was bringing up um, concerns around the level of these charges because Earlier in the meeting, um, David Finder obviously said that there was no particular formula that was set um, when deciding on these charges. So, um, what I'm really concerned about is the number of charges that are above inflation. Because um, I think we've got cost of living crisis, we've got um, people's wages not keeping up, and now we've got a lot of charges that are going to price people out of um, particular. Um, places and I brought up 
before specifically local um, business areas in my ward, Argent Street and Darnley Road. I'm also really concerned about a lot of the increase in charges um, for sports and recreation. Um, and I think what I'd like to, to know is why so many of the charges are above inflation. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, thank you. Uh, when we talk about fees and charges, are we talking about uh, specific ones that you are referring to? Um, or, or yeah, it, well, yeah, I think it's just generally any, okay, any charge. Um, firstly, I, I'm really pleased with the amount of information we've got on this report. And I'm, I mentioned that last time, so well done again to officers for the level of detail. Let, let, let me say any charge which is above inflation. So, I, I get when things go up by inflation, but there, there's so many charges that have um, gone right up that I'm, I'm just really worried about it and the impact it's going to have on forest residents and businesses and leisure organisations affected by people potentially not being able to park. Yeah, sure. Well, across the board, um, the, the, what we have done is try to have a consistent approach. Across our charges. Um, we've also looked at uh, things like we haven't had an increase in three years. Uh, we have benchmarked some of other boroughs to bring ourselves in, and we've looked at the maintenance of the car park, for example, the lines and signs of the city. Uh, and of course, the methodology is within the report, what we, how we came to those figures. Um, so generically, that's generically, but there is a crossover uh, in terms of the second report, which is the introduction to the uh, additional famous play sites. So I don't know if you wanted to see really go through that because I think there's a big crossover there. Can yeah, talk about that. Yeah, um, um, definitely. But um, sort of not on page 15. It, we're looking. I was looking at um, specifically places like Argent Street because they're in my ward and about a 42% increase. And even though, as you said, there's, it hasn't been raised in three years, I'd, I'd still say that 42% is a massive increase that doesn't justify three years of it. Not right. Right. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. yeah, just that interest, is that correct? Yes. That is yeah. correct. Yeah, but the percentage of fees, that's 42%. Yeah. The overall figure that we came to. Yeah, that looks to me like photo symbol. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you something photo symbol. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it yeah. didn't look like it was right. So it's a yes, yeah. 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 Cobble House, Hall, and places like that, and got Bellas Cricket Club, and lots of places that are going to be really detrimentally impacted. I think by having yeah. such a steep increase. So, um, just wonder if I could have your sort of comments on that, please. Yeah. Well, again, these car parks are well used. They're three. They're currently three, but we still have maintenance of the car parks, and we still have. Pay for the maintenance. There is no specific funding elsewhere. So what we're looking at is the use of the car. Those who use the car park pay the display or reducing it. So that's an income. So we have to offset the cost that we, we incur to maintain the actual car park. Council first. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Then yeah, just recast the Kerrins uh, report. It was just in relation to. Where the, where the sort of uh, percentage increase comes from in terms of the amount of inflation. Obviously, it was said when it was three years. And it was just whether to look at larger percentage increases because obviously, basically, 42% is a lot. And then, of course, the last four percent I can see there as well. But it'll be 17 to, to 100. Generally, cancer care answers pretty much what I was going to answer before. Any other questions? Yeah, cancel now. Yeah, sorry, just um, it was just a, a general point with you that when it comes to these charges, I, I, even putting in a new one, um, when you talk about maintenance and things, but um, I just think that any charge which 
what's the just so generally what's the justification for any um charge that's above inflation because there's a number of charges in here which are above inflation so what what would be the justification for making it sort of so above inflation well like i say um you know we've I've mentioned that the maintenance is car parts. The resurfacing, you know, it's huge cost to resurface. I understand that recently uh, we did some potholes which came to 60k alone. We are looking, at, you know, and, and just bearing in mind that you know, when we say we're charging these charges, money is really picked. It's not used for anything else, it goes straight back into car parts and maintenance of those car parts. Okay. Um, Julie, I think you want to make a comment. Good evening, thank you very much. Yeah. I just wanted to answer the question in terms of the general principles around fees and charges. They are in item 3.3 of the report. And so when we, whenever we look at a fees and charge and we look at potentially increasing the fees, we always look at what is our neighbouring authorities charging? Are we breaking even? Um, there's a whole list of the um, areas that we would explore when considering fees and charges. I think the one that you're particularly uh, focusing in on, the 42% in one particular car park, is where we're trying to bring a consistent approach across all of the car parks in the borough, applying fees and charges accordingly. And I think what's happened, the consequence of that, that one uh, car park stands out a little bit. But ultimately, what we're also trying to do is reduce down... Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought just for a second. <laughs> um, is also to sort of bring that consistent approach across the whole authority, as I already stated. Um, does that answer your question? Um, it, thank you very much. It, it answers it in the sense that you've given me um, the reasons, but um, I think I just have to register that I disagree. I, I actually um, appreciate your answer, but I just um, disagree with the principle, but I think the um, sort of the, the amounts they're going up by and, and also the, the new sort of targeting of, sort of leisure and out, outdoor recreation spaces because they're so important and especially more so in recent times with um, the sort of impact of COVID and the importance of you know outdoor green space and the sort of the lack of it that there, there is in a lot of neighbourhoods that some people do have to actually drive to these places to get access to green spaces and I think um, putting charges on our, our recreation places at this time I think is it's just something I, it's just something I disagree with. We're in London Australia and next item that one. Okay. Keep it off this one. We'll talk about that in the next item. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Julie, actually, um, you touched on one of my points. So when you're looking at these fees and figures, you look at neighbouring boroughs. Um, and then on page 13, obviously, you can kind of show that there's a huge reduction in obviously people using the pain space. Was that one of the one of the reasons you looked at this as well? Was it the, the general concern that the revenue went down, which suggests they're 72%? Um, did that make this decision or, or? Um, that's not fundamentally the reason, no. We would always look at fees and charges in the round. COVID has had an impact on a number of income lines across the council, as we, as we all know. Um, we, we have thought long and hard about making this recommendation for fees and charges, and the reason being is that ultimately some of these car parks, and I know the concern around the ledger, is that car parks cost the authority money to provide. Um, even if we weren't maintaining them, we still pay the business rates on those car parks, as well as the maintenance. Some of the rationale behind this is that some of the car parks are in um, not the best repair that we would like. And as a consequence, we have had some claims this year uh, on the car park surfacing. So we want to make them safe. Um, and ultimately, one of the key principles around fees and charges is that break-even position. So that's that's the main reason why we're looking at the fees and charges. And as Phil indicated earlier, we haven't increased parking charges for two years. We try to keep them at a steady level, but ultimately we do have to balance the budget. We also have to maintain the car park. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Um, Councillor Carson. Hey, uh, thank you for your report. And I uh, just wanted to bring into context the implementation bit. I'll um, pick up on the bit uh, Councillor Kevin spoke about the two percent increase on Argent Street. That is from 70 pence for one pound. If it was in line with inflation, the, uh, the uh, rise would be pretty negligible. So if the general word out there, the fund to be able to fund improving and repairing our site. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Can I just ask for one question? Are these um, pounds slay over the same time period? We're just talking uh, nine to five or one day, depending on. But if you look at like pounds slay station, that would be the most reliable, or are we going to make one just every day? Car parks in the city. Well, any, all of the car parks. Do you need one pounds slay for the most week? Uh, if you're talking the garden street, there aren't invited to the current car park. The money that's set in the park to be raised from. Okay, what about the other ones? Yeah, Monday to Saturday. That will be Monday to Saturday. That's Monday, that's free, isn't it? Or well, the first hour. And that will remain free. No change to so What weekends are trying to bring the free? Yeah, so there's going to be no change to the to the current district as in the day exchange of the week. Right. On on the current car parks. And to be grey, the proposal is to keep the hour of the three of the visitors. No change. The charging will only come in after the visitors. So that's so there's going to be no change. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Councillor Kevin, you want to add? And they no one likes increased charges, do they? It's, but we are where we are with these. And the state is some of these parts, so they're only going to get worse. And they do need to. Um, I know we've had some claims for injuries sustained in this part, but I mean, what sort of things that, does that come to? Yeah, the, the last we looked at that was uh, around 24k. Um, but I can say that I saw some of the uh, pretty terrible incidents. The injuries that both residents have perceived as a consequence of a pothole. Uh, we're talking fractured limbs, uh, we're talking two black eyes. So it's pretty, pretty bad. Uh, but yeah, last time I knew it was up to about 24 okay. And And these, uh, these charges, the, the, the finance or the income from these is really fixed. So that would uh, finance ongoing maintenance of these potholes and the machinery as well? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so the spring event that goes straight back into servicing and maintenance and so on and so on. Don't go outside of that. Of course you can. That's a lot of What was your forecasting and maintenance on the prior year? And what was the revenue that you get in order to do that from what you're thinking that if you show up and say the family cars and base it on? I should have I should have bring that with me now. I haven't got that with me now, but I can get that back to you after the meeting to send that with you. Okay, thank you. I think that looks like that's about it for this one. Um, so um, I move to agree recommendations 1.1 and 1.2 on pages 9 and 10. Do we agree? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. Then we move on to item six, uh, which is on page 43 to 52 of the agenda. Introduction of additional planned display sites within Ferris. Uh, we have a resident tonight who wishes to speak on this item. And Mr. Cliff Cansdale, please come forward to present his statement. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman, uh, members of the office. I'd like to start by um, describing what's proposed as an unfair tax on outdoor sport and lifestyles. Um, I believe that our local parks and recreation grounds that contribute to healthy living and residents uh, should be encouraged uh, to visit them and should not be deterred by car parking charges. 
It's my understanding that council policy is to encourage outdoor activity as part of a healthy lifestyle. My concern is that the car park charging will drive away organised sport from the venue, as club members may choose to participate elsewhere, but one of several other venues where sport is played in Thurrock and where it is free to park, or they may choose not to play at all. Teams do not pay for car parking at away fixtures, and it is likely Thurrock teams will be ostracised by leagues and competitions, potentially leading to expulsion and social division. Essentially, Thurrock Council is proposing that a very small subset of the population of Thurrock, which uses Ockenden Recreation Ground very frequently, will be paying a very heavy price for repeated visits as Council looks to gain additional revenue to recover the reported 34.3 million funding gap and we would suggest that contributions to close this gap are made across the whole Thurrock community and not via these proposed car parking charges, so that an unfair and disproportionate financial burden on our membership can be avoided. I wish to point out that the statutory guidance for local authorities on enforcing parking restrictions uh, from the government, section 2.1, states that enforcement authorities should not view it in isolation or as a way of raising revenue. I'd now like to talk about the government's sports strategy, which was published in December 2015. And it had the mantra, a new strategy for an active nation. The first key heading for a series of 23 performance indicators is, and I quote, more people taking taking part in sport and physical activity. I suggest that, with Thurrock, this objective will not be met if Council collects pay and display equipment in the car parks of local recreation grounds, such as that planned at Ockenden. I'd now like to come to the objectives of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport Renewal Task Force. On the 20th of May 2020, the DCMS announced the creation of this task force, chaired by the Right Honourable Oliver Dowden, CBE MP, with the view of ensuring that sport and culture can reopen successfully in the post-COVID period. I believe this is a part of government's pledge to build back better. I therefore suggest that charging to park vehicles at Ockenden Recreation Ground is contrary to the objectives of the government, the DCMS and its renewal task force. I'd now like to speak about Thurrock Council's active play strategy. This strategy was adopted by CABINET at its meeting held on 13 January last year. A council member in recommending the report for adoption said, Sports will be at the centre of the new local plan, and this report will help to increase sport uptake across the borough. I ask you to consider that introducing car parking charges at Ockenden Recreation Ground will not meet these expectations, and participation of outdoor sport at Ockenden will diminish as a result. I'd like to mention similar recreation grounds in Thurrock. I'm of the opinion that to introduce car parking charges at Ockingham Recreation Ground would be unfair. It is the only playing field of its type which is earmarked for charges and all other venues remain free of charge. How can this be fair? For the avoidance of doubt, I'm not suggesting that charges should be inflicted across the area. I'd now like to talk about South Maintenance of Sports Pitches at Ockenden Recreation Ground. Thurrock Council were previously advised that, due to budgetary constraints, sports clubs would have to maintain their own sports pitches with effect from April 2021. This has been fully complied with at Ockenden Recreation Ground. It should be recognised that those actions will save hundreds of thousands of pounds over the next de two decades or so, yet playing field users at Ockenden are paying a heavy price for the costs of grounds maintenance equipment 
to replace that previously used by council operatives. I consider it an insult for sports club members who stay on the ground to carry out this work on a daily basis to then be charged to park to use their vehicles. In the report, it names a South Ockenden Recreational Bench, uh, sorry, South Ockenden Recreational Centre. This incorrect naming was recently reported on several media outlets, including a BBC News website item. I suggest that this is highly misleading and indicates potential concealment of the proposal. I wish to point out the clarity of proposals to the public is referenced within section five of the statutory guidance for local authorities on enforcing car parking restrictions issued by the government. Further, part 2.7 of the council proposal encourages a large turnover of vehicles. I consider this to be wholly inappropriate for Ockenden Recreation Ground, which is a small basic public park and not in any way a recreational centre, which implies multiple single visits from across the region. Part 2.4 of the same report discusses reducing anti-social behaviours. It says that the lack of parking enforcement also means that these car parks do not receive regular patrols, leaving these areas more prone to abandoned vehicles. Light tipping and travel incursions, anti-social behaviour and nuisance behaviour. And so far as Ockenden Recreation Ground is concerned, I believe that the reverse is true. I say that a car parking charge would deter proper usage of the park, leading to more problems, not less. <clears throat> the vigilance of our members has, in the past, resulted in successful outcomes from their reporting of a wide range of very occasional antisocial behaviour and opinions, such as racist chanting and graffiti, drug use, fly tipping, vandalism and motorbike incursion, most of which would otherwise have gone unreported. When, for example, a local sports club had to move away from another public park due to council spending cuts in the mid-1990s, drug dealing replaced cricket and the local crime rate went up. Hardly a coincidence, I would suggest. Please do not make this mistake for offering the recreation ground. In the report, there appears to be a perceived contradiction of funding requirements. Mr. Kenza, could you give that back up? Uh, yes, I've just got a few more lines. I note that there appears to be a contradiction with the proposal document. On page one, it is clear from the executive summary that Council needs to remedy the funding gap over the next two financial years and the basis for introducing additional car park charging. However, on page seven, the senior management accountant has recorded that car parking income can only be used for car parking purposes and has to be ring fenced for that sole purpose. But I question whether the estimated annual income of £159,964 is far in excess of what the actual maintenance costs are for each of the four venues highlighted in the report. Very briefly, a very brief point on a lack of clarity over the issuing of permits of sports clubs, which has been um, mentioned in the report. We don't think that that's going to work and we can't have our captains and team managers monitoring ins and outs of the car park that people want to support their children to play cricket. Mr Chairman, members and officers, thank you for your time. Thank you for considering my report. Thank you, Mr Kent. Uh, would the officer like to respond to Mr Kent? Yes, yeah, sure, thank you for that. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the uh, as being crime that you mentioned. To, uh, so from our experience, uh, having controlled by our civil enforcement it does uh, produce social behaviour crime. That's a fact. Uh, they are trained to report online social behaviour, not only just to inspect vehicles in car park. That they are trained more specific. They know to do that, and they do do that. And in, 
in terms of reducing uh, ancestral gathering, there's also an option to look at NPR, which is automatic member state uh, recognition. And that there is known throughout the whole country. There's everybody else to know that that reduces crime. And that's an option for us to use. And it's much better than, uh, uh, I would say, because you've got trace of vehicles out and they're flighting. The traces are one off by the encampments which we go in some of these car parks. Uh, so, in, in its entirety, we believe that it does reduce crime and ancestral behaviour. Uh, in terms of the sports club, we have had some initial consultation with the clubs and we have discussed permitting schemes where clubs who play fixtures won't be charged. They will, there will be a permitting scheme that has been made. Um, and that's something that we can take up further and discuss if this paper proceeds. So this paper is, is suggesting that people who play organised fixtures will be charged. People who come for fixtures uh, will have a permitting scheme. Furthermore, at South Ockenden Direct, there's an area, grass treated, which is not part of the proposal. That's an area that's been discussed with the sports group that they could use free of charge during their fixture. So there is existing space at that site that wouldn't be part of the permitting scheme where they could park a particular number of vehicles. So you, there is there are multiple options to make sure people can continue using the site as before their fixture. Uh, um, and we'll continue to work with the clubs to find a scheme that, that's suitable. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Stan. Thank you. Can we now proceed to the officers' report? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, our experience is that the car parks are being tape or used by residents. And as a consequence, uh, as Julie mentioned earlier, they they deteriorate. We require improved management to prevent injury or from residents to prevent damage to vehicles. Um, the cost to the residents to propose car parks is currently free, as I said. Yeah, but there is a cost to the county in terms of the maintenance. Um, so the report recommends introducing charges for these car parks purely to offset the cost of maintenance and provide improved services for the residents. Uh, the has clearly mentioned about the operation uh, of car parks, uh, the, the suggestions around that. One of the things to note is the country park at Langley Hill crosses boundary lines with West Expense Council. Should the proposal be agreed, full consultation will need to take place with UCC in advance of any introduction or implementation. Uh, currently, the Parks are subject to management agreement with both borough and ECC, and it's in different parts of the country park. This is also being reviewed uh, at the request of ECC. Um, I mentioned about the one of the things that we want to look into as an option is ANPR. I think it's strongly agreed that that would be a good suggestion if it could be uh, Sorry. Oh, NPR, so I thought I mentioned it earlier, automatic template recognition. Uh, so, in a nutshell, the, the introduction of these charges will assist in the medium long term financial plan and anticipated income of circa 150k, again outlined in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me know the motion to take the report. Um, we'll go Councillor Kelly first, please. <laughs> Sorry, right, so um, let's have a look at some of uh, what the gentleman said, what the responses were. So um, how many, you said obviously there were some offset spaces that would be used. Um, how many roughly would we need to be sure? Probably 35. Um, so uh, so the, the discussion we had with the groups as part of the consultation was that area needs a bit of work. Those works would be done if this proposal goes through. We, we would look to make sure that the designated area and the paid for area, there's a distinction uh, with either gate or fence to make sure that it, no, no one just can go and park across the road. So it's sort of going to be uh, 
play fenced off you know, in the sense that it's not meant to have a time between Monday, Tuesday, and Leeds. There's three sports groups there the cricketers, the football club, and the balls club. Then you mentioned about the permit scheme. How, how does that work in a practical sense? Because obviously, there's a suggestion there that's not too practical, and your suggestion is that actually to solve the problem. So, and as an example, uh, if you go to uh, the sports group or, or you go to a supermarket, if you have the AMPR system, you have the tablet that's normally in the clubhouse, um, you punch your numbers in, whoever's authorised to use that tablet will get free parking. That's an example at Chelmsford Cricket Ground when we go in, you punch numbers in, or a supermarket, you have, you have that ability. Most of the key sports groups will be coming to play matches. Or use the there is a dedicated pavilion associated to that ground. There's there's a clubhouse area, a shaving room. That could be given to the community interest company that manages that site. There is a, a way where people are going in and out of the building where they can punch those numbers in and they could gain free parking. So that would be on top of the dedicated space. But if someone wants to park in the general area, there is ways around that. Okay, and then lastly, and there's no sort of this is seven days a week. We wouldn't get a situation where obviously the sports club does some music more than the guests. Yeah, or maybe we should do some kind of days a week. That's not the agenda. Yeah, that's, that's not the agenda. Well, that's what we've proposed here in the report seven days a week. And, yeah. and for the reasons I said, it's probably deterioration doesn't stop us for one Saturday. No, no, no. It's when you yeah. use it. And that's the normal issue. Yeah, no, I understand that. It's just because um, obviously when you look at the uh, figures, obviously it does sort of suggest that people still give a shit and bring them up around for a year, two years. They pay for the switch to the bigger one, which brings that attention. I mean, I know that's not something that you've got to on, but it's sort of one of the, the arguments you need to, to, need to fix it. That could potentially fix it, but obviously that doesn't necessarily solve the problems which is not really needed. So, all right then, um, and then one last question, is there, do these sports clubs use them during the week, or is it just mainly the weekends? In the week as well they train. They train the way. Yeah, so, right. the, so, the, so the dedicated space is one of the ways of allocating some space where they will be impacted. Yeah. Um, but there's a permitting scheme proposal in addition to that. Okay, right, well, thank you. That's, that's it for my end. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, going back, I think that became from my question, but I'll forgive him. Um, Mr. Kamalji. Um, so, what I wanted to get to is that you know this piece of land that you could basically turn it into a sports bay for next facility, but you will be doing that work first. Is that correct? You will do that work first, give that to the land before you start doing charges on the car park. So we did a review of the car park to see what the current condition is of all the proposed car parks, and we've got a quotation to do the work. But if this proposal goes forward, the investment would go into the car parks first, and then the proposal. And that's something we will have to look at because we have to look at the timing. Exactly, that's what the problem, right? Now, yeah. and I tell you what, because I was thinking about this the other day, and I tell you what, because if you are, if you, if you are saying this car park, we've got 30, first of all, that's investment been done on how many cars actually use that car park. So, so the amount of cars that use that car park, forget about what the big stuff you use, yeah. the amount of cars that use that car park will bring in enough revenue to tarmac that and put an APR system in. Right, it's, okay. it's already tarmac. That car park that already has a dedicated tarmac area with white light. So okay. it's already got that. You've yeah. got maintenance on that, haven't yeah. you? So, so it will cover the cost of the maintenance, do a fixing maintenance of when it next to be tarmac, and also you're going to put an APR system and it's going to give a cost. It will bring in a yeah. Yeah. And that's six pounds if you're going to get them all the other cars that's coming in here, apart from the six club and the whoever you use that, is enough to maintain that. That's yes. Right. So what would that for me if I would rather have that bit of scrub land or whatever you want to give, tarmac all out and give over to the cricket club before you start doing anything in the car park 
because then their cricket club would have to start paying the car park while you're doing that. They can use that at the moment. It's already been used. But you're saying we're really charged to consider. How long would it take you? I'm trying to find a timeline on. This proposal goes ahead. What is your timeline where the cricket club can be playing it free of charge, along with all the other bowls, clubs, and everything else, while you are doing this other piece of land for them to run into without charging them? You're going to give them a good revenue revenue. So that, that work will be done at the same time simultaneously. So you're doing all this simultaneously, but, that, but I just want to ensure that it's so salient that those don't now agree that this piece of land and definitely the thirties, definitely being fed, and definitely everything's put in place, everything shiny and bright for the for the club. And while that's happening, they do not get charged in that whole time. Yes, so the club will get charged regardless at the moment, but that area will be repaired and put into a good state for them to use. When that's in place, if they need to park in the main car park, there's a proposed permitting scheme as well. So they've got that as an additional, uh, additional. And, what, and the other question is, what happens if this is a training ground and they have young young people that's being trained up? The parents go and drop them off and wait for them. Do the parents get a permit? Do the parents be allowed to go into the car park? Or do they get charged £6.50? So £6.50 is for the whole day, and obviously the training will last a full day. The parents could use the designated area that the clubs have access to. Um, a lot of those children are local, most of those clubs are from the area, so we encourage active travel, active walking, um, most of the residents can come uh, locally. Those who do need to come, will, we estimate, will fit into the designated space that's been allocated. That's it. All I'm concerned about is if these charges go in and the parents don't want to pay that, then the cricket club or the football club, the bowls club and all that, they will, they will have no deal. They will just have to come. And, and we just don't want that. We want them to come. Yes, no, definitely. We do as well. And I think it's important. We're, we're trying to get the balance right. Obviously, parents and children also have had accidents in some of the car parks that we're proposing. And so we want to create safe services where kids can visit. Um, Old House Court has had a number of potholes that we repeatedly uh, filled over the last two years. And there isn't a budget for that, but it's one of the most popular destinations. And so the, the proposal just enables us to bring these car parks to a higher standard. So can I, sorry, Chair, can I just have one more One more. Is there an opportunity for these car parks to have a lower tariff on the weekends? Have we done modelling about that to see if it will work out in the city? Well, what we've done is we've <laughs> consistent approach from our experience that we've had across our council and its approach to taking over the Can we look at that? Well, I feel it's more than at the weekend, but people with their kids can spend more at the weekend. We can look at it. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for your call and uh, thank you for your uh, statement. So I'm just going to go to this bit of land that's set aside for the clubs that they want the other clubs that they can use and that money will be paid. Is that cost in uh, the cost of remedial work? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'll just yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you know, we're hearing lots about how we're going to mitigate this group and that group. I mean, I didn't declare an interest earlier because I, I haven't got direct involvement with often do with Red, but I do know as a, a as a parent of children who both play cricket and football, it's um it's urged on a full time job for parents. when I'm not at that committee meeting, I'm normally at a or, or whatever. And I think um this whole argument of reduced of putting in a perm of putting in um, parking tariffs which reduces antisocial behaviour. I think the, I, I agree with uh, the statement that the gentleman made. It's actually the reverse is true. Actually, that the more you have people using, like if you, the more you have football teams, cricket teams, bowlers, um, joggers, dog walkers, the more people you have using these parks, um, 
the more it deters antisocial behaviour. I, I know of car parks in my world that have, got, that have had um, charging for years and still have had antisocial behaviour. I think, I'm not sure I'd sort of agree with that argument. I'd rather see a park that's alive with direct residents using them rather than being deterred by this. And I, I know we talk about green, green fence, fencing and things like that, but there's no getting away really from the context that these charges are being brought in, which is the sort of £34 million pound budget gap. And, I think I, I, I don't think this has been brought in on its own merits of oh we need to reduce antisocial behaviour let's put some parking meters in I think we're literally looking to draw every single penny to try and reach a gap and the trouble is the people using these parks didn't cause the budget gap I think it, I think we're just going to have a real problem I think with usage um, especially if you're a parent who has cricket training on and they're not going to walk because um, clubs, just because it's Bellas Cricket Club, it doesn't mean all their members come from Ockendon and Bellas. It's the same as all said Cricket Club, you know, they come from around the whole of Thurrock. And if you've got, if you think of the charges, if you've got a child who's got Monday night training with their football team, um, then the, the granddad goes to bowling, um, you know, and then you've got cricket training, and then you've got a match on a Sunday, you've got another match on Saturday, you know, if you think of the charges that this is bringing into families, I think it's actually becoming a quite a heavy burden on people who just want their children to play sport, really. So I don't, not so much a question of the state, I think, but yeah, I just, um, it's, it's something I feel really passionately about because, but I'm not directly affected by this particular proposal, um, and I could be if one of my kids was on an away team going to play one of these things. So, you know, I think it's just something that's going to affect families. Yeah, no. I understand that. Uh, as I said, uh, and I'm sorry if I couldn't repeat myself, it, it's, not, it's not just about reaching the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the mid term to long term cost of the council and trying to pull that back. It's also, and I'll keep repeating, it's also about the upkeep of car parks. In terms of that social behaviour, um, we all know crime happens, it, it, it happens, and then social behavior happens. There's people there already, there's people not. No, um, uh, Julia, BB1, come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I can't always hear everything that's being said in the room, but um, there's a couple of points that I just wanted to reassure on. Um, thank you uh, for the representative who's represented the club tonight. I think that the conversation has been really useful and helpful to us and will inform how we take this forward. And I can actually say, um, and, and I, you know, officers in the room probably didn't feel that they had the authority to do so. We will be going through a full TRO process which involves full consultation. So, there's a minimum of 12 weeks involved in that process alone. We will actively work with the club to make sure that we find a solution that works well for them as well as for the authority. We won't be in, um, imposing any charges until we've resolved the area that, that's been discussed. I think it was 35 uh, space that Jaha was referring to. We will make sure that everything is as it should be before we start to put those charges into place because we want to make this as seamless as possible for residents. We I, I take on board the comments about um, people wanting to be active in the local area. We totally agree with all of that. And I just want to clarify one other point around the MTFS and the income from, from car parks. The cost of maintaining car parks comes from revenue budgets um, and ultimately will have an impact on the MTFS if we do not bring income in to offset those costs. And that's why I think there's a little bit of confusion in the room around how we're saying in, in the introduction around the MTFS position, but ultimately that the funding is ring fenced for car parks. We can only use, use money that comes in from car parking fees for maintaining car parks, signage, lines, so yellow lines as well as white lines, and those all those things associated with parking and parking enforcement. So I just wanted to clarify those few points and hope that that's been helpful for you today. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to 
Thank you, David. Um, that's a tell. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Julie. So, um, obviously, we have a lot of energy and uh, folks on Ockenden. Just looking at what happened on the other side. So, Hull House Pool and uh, One Tree Hill. I think, obviously, for myself, obviously, I do visit these places. I also do visit other places in Essex. It's not too uncommon to do those at uh, one of these parks to, to pay charges. So, I can see how, how they've come along. Obviously, I feel very nervous over Ockenden. So um, I just hope that a lot of these comments are being taken on board. Uh, Tamaris, my first question is, I need a bit of a better understanding about this one, because obviously I know the car park at the top of Tamaris Road, but I'm not entirely aware of the whole situation surrounding, is this the bottom of Tamaris Road? So uh, the impact on the train station, I, I imagine. So it's not near the train station, but it's near enough to park. And so what's the situation with Tamaris? Yeah, okay, so we, we did an exercise uh, around uh, looking at uh, how many vehicles are parking down that main stretch of road, and we looked at the times as well. So, tell uh, that during the day, there's a 60% increase in vehicles that are parking, which suggests to us that as opposed to yes, in the evening, it suggests to us that commuters are using that long stretch of road. We're trying to do is have a fair approach to where we to park free. Using park for um, and for commuters to pay. That, that's it in a nutshell, really. The exercise showed us that commuters are using that space, taking up. We're, we're just trying to be fair to the residents, so residents have access to parking bays where they can park. They do get under the side of the residents do say that that's how that. Oh. Yeah, no, okay, I get that. I mean, obviously, we're going over our park to show soon, but I mean, ultimately, they are taking long journeys on trains, so we haven't got some park to show. Obviously, we do need to survive in space, obviously, this is part of the problem. Um, but in general, I do understand the problem of Tamaris there. That's what the this is. Um, what about in terms of Hull House for one tree here went off? Is there any sort of uh, concern over the surrounding area? So let's say you introduce these sport ones to Hill. I'm thinking of the approach road to Coalhouse Pool, um, the area surrounding up in the creation ground. I mean, naturally, people might start parking on the streets. And that's a good major reaction, but ultimately, yeah, there is a concern here that it's just going to park surrounding area. So uh, it's the last thing I did. I want and some of those areas you've mentioned, like I mentioned earlier, that boundary lines, uh, so that will be quite useful. Uh, in, in terms of one tree, tree hill, but the other is Cold House Bowl, Recreation Ground, I can see that as well. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be nervous about that. Jim. Which is not possible because it's quite right, but we need to get that up. So that, that's something I can see going forward. Um, that's it for the moment. Um, um, thank, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to page 46, we've got Langdon Hills Country Park. Didn't that actually add me an authority to roads and car parking charges there, but add them onto Essex? Well, we, we maintain the car park, uh, and again, we'll be liaising, uh, we'll be in talk to BCC, City Manager Mark, and that will be part of eventually consultation that we'll need to do. So we're just sort of assuming they're going to pay forward at the moment? No, we're not assuming, this is proposal to them, but it's right. part of a consultation. Okay. So, you know, we do manage language as country parks, so there's two ranges. That are Barrett County employees that manage the park, the country park as a whole, both near the car park, as well as the car park, and then we decide to use a, the triple SI designation that cross boundary. But so we actually manage the whole site. Uh, <clears throat> although it crosses boundaries, uh, we manage the site. Uh, 
Yeah, I just normally get the situation we've got with like Benless where it's, it's out of park, but yeah, yeah, yeah so far far so. So Bellas is managed by Essex, although a lot of it is within us, within ours, and we manage Langford Hill. So both are, that's the agreement that management is using. Going, going back to um, the, the recreation park, because it is a recreation park, it's not a recreation centre, it's never been called that, it's places. Um, I have echo the concerns of uh, most of the council, all the council have been on the uh, city tonight. It's a very small part, but I think also forgetting that uh, people also turn up there to go to the cemetery as well. So it's not just sports, uh, but that's, that's part of it too. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Cantor was not too keen on, on permitting, but I think if, if we are able to, where you have a sort of fair week going to some hotel, for example, like you said before, where you just tap in the number plate and that you sort it. I think that would be beneficial. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to see it down there if that is not on the cards. Um, so I do agree with uh, Mr. Cantor that I mean, uh, if, if you're relying on um, paper permits or something, that's going to be a nightmare. It's not going to be for people to drive off with that. It's going to not, not be uh, bad. So I, I think you know um, we ought to be very clear that whilst in principle, I, I think it's fair you know, we understand the reasons for these charges that you know, until this is further explored, and uh, you know, if we can do something to help us sort of stuff further, I think we can do. And I'd rather like to see some more proposals coming forward in a future meeting, if you know, just to, you know, to, to see what it is we've been able to agree. So rather than to leave it here, mm -hmm. as a, a, a future, uh, maybe the next PTR, that might be in a uh, useful year now, we'd love to come back and see what has been agreed and the, the, the way that it's going forward. Because we, we would like to leave it where Go away, we do our own thing, and then we're left in a situation we're not happy with. So, I think um, as long as that's the case, that we will stay in contact and we will, you know, it's with the sports clubs, so you know, which is a preferred way forward for them, then I'm unhappy to, to uh, proceed. So, I think with that, um, are we all happy to agree the recommendation on page 44 to consider the proposals and support the recommendation of the cabinet for additional planning display facilities and car parks? Bearing in mind, or do we, do we want to add on to that? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I mean, for me, I'm, in general, I'm happy to support them on the basis of the liability side of things, but obviously, a lot of interesting comments have come up here this evening that I think should at least be considered going forward. So, for me, it would be looking to see if potentially just like we're doing, I think it's just like we're doing, yeah, I believe so, yeah. Um, we could look at a reduction in cost potentially of throughout. So the seven days a week reduction, that's one option. Maybe look at it um, free at weekends. Um, it might be worth it. It'd be interesting to see if, if it is introduced, whether this, this system works. So this AAPR system, and we can test it for a while, see if this, this additional parking lot even works. I would also be interested to see if we introduce these and it then causes the problem in surrounding areas. I'll be interested to see what the reaction is there. Instead of it just being double yellow lines, I'd like it to be considered reversing because double yellow lines cause problems, don't solve problems. And by introducing these, we're going to introduce issues in the surrounding area. Probably not so much Tamaris, it's more probably Coa Sport and um, Yogg in the Recreation Centre. That, that should be, we should be aware of that. I don't think we can implement this and then, you know, Deny responsibility that we we there's a problem surrounding the area. So just generally things like that um, that should be considered by Captain before they go ahead. Yeah, I'm just the same council. I would, yeah. I would like to uh, just bring to everybody's attention the fact that this this report did actually go to Captain previously, uh, but in light of our previous relations um, with the fact, so you discussed it and thought well, it's only fair that the people for a change listened, and uh, we had it now back in the committee. So. I believe that uh, notes have been taken and uh, the officers have listened to what they have to say. And uh, I think they've acted some of the recommendations at the very least. So, Councillor Kerry. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chair. So, in terms of this recommendation, obviously the word consider is fine because we have considered the proposal. But my, my issue with it is support the recommendation to cabinet to create additional pay and display facilities. I, I don't actually support it. Um, so, and unless we sort of um, Know, change that to I don't know, note the recommendation or we've discussed it or you know something to recognize the facts we've shared our opinions but I'm not 
happy to put my name to something that um, if this is supported because I, I don't. So obviously I, I think I voted. I won't be fully voted down, but I just um, I just want uh, in this current version. I'm, I'll be voting against the list of changes. Okay. I think that's actually a comment. I think those are the immunity that uh, Councillor Kerry uh, is back for the reasons given. Uh, but I think we, we are here to make decisions, and uh, I feel that uh, you know, we think we should need to go to a vote on the recommendation. So, all those in favour of the recommendation, you make your hand for All those against? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to item seven, which is parking policy and strategy and parking design and development standards on pages 53 to 160 of the agenda. Can I ask who's doing these today? Uh, Matt, Matt say to introduce them for? Yeah, you think so, exactly. So, um, I'm just going to keep this short. So, um, members of the committee will recall that the parking policy and strategy document and the parking design and development standards and the parking enforcement strategy were presented to uh, over the scrutiny committee on the meeting in October of last year. Um, the uh, document set out uh, the proposed um, policy to uh, assist and oversee the provision of parking, uh, both in the current situation and into the future along with uh, considerations for changes in technology, infrastructure, um, and uh, management parking, and also um, a technical standards document that identifies how parking provisions should both be designed uh, and quantities for new developments, uh, and also the management of the enforcement process. Um, when the paper was presented to uh, in October, it was not uh, proposed a recommendation by members of the committee. Um, however, the document was uh, proposed to go to cabinet in December and January 2022. Following uh, consultation with the chair of this committee, um, additional opportunity has been asked to further scrutinise the report. Um, and Prior to um, the reports going to the Energy Cabinet, there have been some very minor um, revisions uh, to the document that are listed in the report. They are just changes to um, tables and an image uh, and one additional paragraph added. Um, and members of the committee are asked to take uh, an additional opportunity to review and propose recommendations or amendment to the document. Thank you. Right, over to the committee. And we need to start on this one. Yeah, go ahead. So just, just because I'm obviously we've looked at this document, obviously it's very large. We're very nervous that when we looked at it last time, it seems to be quite London and city centre. And so in, in sort of if you look at this, what has anything changed substantially? I mean, we saw it last time go away, we wanted to see if we could be ahead of the game. I know when we recently approved the development of Spring Springhouse. We asked officers to go away with a uh, lot more visitor parking. Perspective, we were able to do it like that. We saw new technology in terms of the double stacking. Um, the jury's out on that. I'm not sure how successful that will be or, or if it's an opportunity. It seems quite positive on what we do. And it was a sort of a modern approach in terms of these um, um, are sorts of your Amazon drivers. You, you get Five, six, seven of these things turning up in the street in one, just one day, coming mm -hmm. back again the next. Where do they park? Um, to an example today, I was driving down the street and once the parking really closed, uh, none of them put it. Um, really, a parking strategy should acknowledge the issue that we place there. And ultimately, if you look at the last development, 100 houses, 200 houses, really, we're not just looking at spaces, we're looking at spaces for, for loading. Unloaded. Um, so that's something I'd like to see in this. Um, I think without going on about it too much, I guess the first commuter parking, one area you could probably work well is actually Lakeside, half and half, one story, top floors and top people, free charge. Lakeside, I think, have always turned a blind eye to. I don't think they've turned a blind eye to the pyramid. I think they're quite sensible in the sense that 
through the news shopping centre as well from time to time. And I think that's really good if you do that by looking at that and saying, how do you give this new public transport? Also providing them an option to use their car get to a uh, bus station so you can be charging the charging inside resting the green and privacy with the new public transport. So generally just things like that that I love seeing trying to do it is unpleasant. I mean I, I have trouble with people saying to find crazy simply not enough parking. That's what my issue was with the last time. And yeah, it was just to see if anything any of that was taken taken note and challenge to be actually looking at. Um, so just to clarify that there, there had been no yeah. So to bring it back is to be not too bad last time. Sorry. So, so, yeah, so the, the, the purpose of this report opportunity to oh, okay. to, to change it. Oh, okay, so thank you. Right. Um, so that's it for my that's the care initiatives. Yeah, thank you. So no, no, I'm, I'm, no, no, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Um, so yeah, last time, uh, first I just want to say again, mm -hmm. I like detailed reports. I like agendas that you know treasury tags rather than staple. So thank you for that. And our issue before wasn't was the, um, the amount of detail on the report, just some of the things in there. So I know there have been no substantial changes, but I've got a question following on from Councillor Kelly. And two particular things that interest me. Firstly, um, parking for new developments. Um, how how are is parking for new developments sort of keeping pace with the fact that um, the nature of families are changing, people live at home for longer because of property prices so um you know a family that had one car ends up having three outside because the two children become adults there and also one that's quite pertinent to um what grades in particular i'm going to mention grades obviously but um school um, parking um what sort of measures are in place to support schools and the communities around schools uh, with parking because i know we've spoken a lot about parking tonight and you know, we disagree, but we've had a good discussion on things. Um, what things, what would you say in here is going to be the thing where you could go to a parent or a person who lives in the street at school and say, this is going to help you with the issue you get from school parking? Um, thank you, Chair. I think um, if you could turn to pages 146 onwards, um, this is drills down into the parking standards that we, that we are proposing to, to be adopted by the authority when looking at new developments. Um, you see there's a range of different uh, use classes. Uh, it's, it's actually page 142 onwards. Oh, okay. um, and it's a range of different uses. Now, the use classifications are planning sort of terminology, um, but there's an element of um, explanation within them. So there's things like medical centres, indoor sport, recreation, Fresh day nursery and day centres, um, and there's resident, uh, non residential institutions for provision of education, so that's basically schools. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that there is um, standards that are applied um, to, to make sure that there's a, there's a good provision within schools. One of the things that um, is identified as part of these standards is adequate pick up and drop off facilities yeah. to be provided within the school, not. The, the, the current situation, most of all around the bar where the pick up and drop off facilities are outside onto the highway. We're actually expressively asking for it to be provided within the site, yeah. um, not just for school transport provision, but also for those parents that choose to drive their children to school to pick up and drop off purposes. Um, a recent example of that would be the Oxford Academy that was at Planning Committee um, yeah. in about October last year, uh, where there was a significant proportion of parking provided, um, not just for for the, for the range of uses, but also because there was um, proposals for playing pitches that could become multifunctional, so the use at the weekend, yeah. um, and there was requirements for that parking provision within the school to be opened up to those uses as well. So not just providing parking for that use, you know, parking for that use, but more trying to provide a multifunctional provision to maximise that parking 
uh, moving forward when we when we look to the future for, for demand. So um, a lot of the land uses have those sort of elements in mind. So you know, focuses on um, it's based mainly on the area of where the development is. So for example, if it's in an area that's right next to the train station within a town centre location, the, the opportunities to relax that parking stand is there because there's opportunities for people to take other modes. But if there's um, sites that are away from those areas, such as you know, out in Orsett or Horndon or places like that, then there's an emphasis on providing appropriate parking in accordance with, with these standards. So yeah, I, I feel that members should be satisfied that the, the range approach that we're taking uh, based on the facilities that are in the area that's existing, not looking at what the developer is putting on as an offer, uh, which could be short lived for the established connections and, and facilities. Um, there's there's an opportunity to provide that range of parking across the, across the bar. Yeah, so, um, Carry on, Chair. Of course, yeah. In terms of school parking, I think you're right in what you say that you know, new school proposals have parking built in. Um, what, what about existing schools that, you know, say started life as a one form entry school back in the 60s and now four, you know, three or four form entry? So, what mitigation um, can there be? In, in, in particular, I think obviously on my wall, Belmont Castles and Parker Road. Um, in, in neighbouring Wall, St Thomas of Canterbury, um, got a much bigger catchment now than when it first started. So, but uh, if, if we accept that new schools will go through a planning process that require parking, what about mitigating places that are already there? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think um, the reports that are before you, are the, for example, this one, which is Park Standards for Development yeah. Standards, this is a document for any development that comes forward. Right. So. Uh, for example, if it's a one form entry primary school that wants to expand to a two or three or four form, there's that opportunity as part of that planning process to, to seek mitigation to, to deal with that impact. Um, it, it's not suited or it's not designed for mitigating existing school sites that have an established problem. Um, that's actually dealt with through another part of, of what we do in terms of transportation to try and mitigate those impacts um, on that network. Um, that's where the parking policy and strategy comes in. It kind of gives a direction of how we, we tend to direct our resources into dealing with those established problems. Uh, one one thing that we, we like to try and encourage all schools is uh, travel planning, so we can try and identify where those acute problems are. We can try and allocate resources to, to target into those areas, but that obviously requires the assistance of the schools because they know the school their their own catchment and yeah. what their requirements are better than what we would. But it's kind of a, a collaborative approach between schools and, and the authority. One last point. You certainly can. That's right. And um, with new developments, um, sort of residential developments, one of my bugbears uh, here in council in this area, because we've got a train station going through it, um, we, we often get, um, you know, not adequate parking places because it's, well, we, you're this close to a train station, assuming that everyone is just going to use a train because they, they live by it and um, going forward what, what have we, what's our sort of um, view on developments that try and try to barter down the number of parking places because all we're doing is creating problems where people will have cars and vans and they just go onto the street rather than in front of their the properties or in the basement of the flats that build you know yeah yeah um, thanks chair the um, I think the main problem is is that what, the, what we've had over the last 10, 15 years without an adequate parking policy is it's been very difficult to to adequately argue and, and evidence that there is a, a, a material problem. You know, and, you know, um, you know, you're probably aware that you know, government policy on parking standards has, has been slowly shifting towards this appropriate parking provision. You know, you go back in 12 years, it was all about maximum parking standards, reduce the parking down at source, yeah. to try and deter people from owning cars. That, as part of the MPPF, that's now changed to, to move it more steadily to a, a more appropriate mix of parking based on a yeah. range approach, the direction we're kind of pushing forward with. Um, and I, yeah, I totally agree with you, there are some developments that have come forward and, and um, developers always try to drive down those parking numbers and I think this is just a tool for us to try and push that parking standard back up again. 
uh, to try and challenge the assumptions that have been made by by developers yeah. who, who are who are obviously trying to to try and maximise their developments as much as possible. Anything else, Jay? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to sort of uh, jump in a little bit here. Um, what you just said, you know, trying to sort of uh, drive the number of parking spaces a bit more the other direction. I'm not sure that's the case. Um, one of the phrases that crops up time and time again in this report is modal shift. And it's basically an attempt to uh, get people to not use cars and move on to other forms of transport. Um, but that's not real work. Uh, I mean, if you turn to page 71 of the um, report here, then you've got a list of the walls and you've got a list of um, a percentage of no cars and a percentage of cars, um, families in one car up to four cars. And if you go down the list, you can see it's overwhelmingly uh, this is the case that people have uh, one or more cars. And it's a very small percentage in most walls that people don't have. Um, one of the issues I have is that on a lot of those walls, there's train stations. If the public wanted a mobile shift, they could have had a mobile shift years ago, should they so chose to do so, but they don't. Instead, usage of cars is increasing all the time. Now, we, we get into the crazy situation where the, the developers are encouraged to build houses that don't have dedicated parking spaces outside of their front doors, and yet we're being told that each house should have um, a charging meter for an electric car. Well, I can't park there, and what's, what's, what's going on there? But, you know, this certainly this first report, and it's broken in three three sections, which is quite handy. Uh, the parking policy and strategy document, I think, for the same reasons we rejected it last time, it just isn't real well. And, yeah. um, you know, at the end of the day, people do not want to get out of their cars and go to another form of transport. They could have done. We've had years for years and years about reasonable bus routes, we've had reasonable train routes. Why would they suddenly change? But it seems to me that this document out of three is basically we will, you know, we wish to force people out of their cars to use other forms. We wish to force people not to have a car because we're not going to provide parking spaces. You know, and I think the minute you start forcing people to do things, that's when you, you get problems. So I, I think we've got exactly the same issue with the document this time. As we had last time. I mean, for example, we've just been talking about PPAs uh, areas around Lockington and the, the problem, and it's not just Lockington, anywhere with a train station, there tends to be a PPA because obviously people drive to the train station to go to work, which is something that don't want to happen. So, in order to actually have a parking space, you have to create a PPA so that the residents there can have somewhere to park. On page 84 of this document, you're looking to charge for PPA in the future. So you're penalising people for living near the very mode of transport you wish people to move on to. Well, I'm afraid that that cannot be the case. We move on to page 93. We're talking about possible structure for emissions-based permit charges. Now, what, what's all that about? Again, last time we had a look at this, and there's no, there's no hint of any charges, only in the sort of scale that you might propose. Um, now, I, I get that we've got some uh, you know, issues with pollution in, in this borough, but what are we doing? Are we saying that we're going to charge the people of Furrow uh, extra money, like tax them, drive them Furrow, but what about people who drive through? What happens to that? There's no mention of that on here. So, you know, I think this particular part of the, the whole scenario, this particular document of the three, is, well, it's no different to last time. So, you know, I'd like to see what the members of the committee think. Thank you. Um, I, on the whole, I probably agree with um, Pat Pistone on a lot of things he said. My ward, if you look at what my ward is, it's huge, but it's south of this bus bar and um, Pebble in Kent. We've only got one train station sitting there. So the chances are everybody's got a car. Every single person on the new development will have a car. Everybody that will, like in London Road at the moment, go down London Road by Perfect Academy, it's round for car being fixed by it. So it's, it's going to happen. So by reducing even the spaces on the new development, so I've got open to know that they will not be paid and we will go to that as well. Um, I feel that all this will do is this will just go into the streets anyway. There's not enough parking. 
Councillor Kelly is actually not the chair planning or sitting planning and believe you me, every single time that occasion, we've got a problem with parking, not enough parking, or the wrong sort of parking, or not enough disability, because if you look at your dwelling houses on the high and you've got 0, 0, 0 to 1.5 spaces per dwelling on page 114, does that take also into account the certain disabilities in that interdevelopment? Because in a new development, you're supposed to have disability car parking as a given. Is that, is that, is that can you put context on that? But you could be less parking for everybody else that isn't. Well, disability there. You know, so I just think that like, you really need to think about this. I do understand we should be all green. I do understand that we should be on bicycles and using the river more. Council of Civil Service should be. Be chopping up big about both, you know, and I agree, but at the moment, we're not going to get away from getting less car parking spaces in development mm. with the amount of people coming into our housing. Chair, there was, a, there was a range of questions that you that you posed, Jen, and obviously your, your colleague as well. Um, if I just refer to the, the elements of the parking standards, and then I could refer back to that on the strategy, yeah. that's more within his uh, realm of influence. Um, with, with regards to the strategy, um, that's been designed based on evidence gathering. Um, yes, um, it's been, we've been using uh, case studies, so we've used the chapter 100 development as a case study. So that gave us a very good mix of um, pre MPPF data of what developments were, um, were having, and also pre what we call uh, planning policy guidance 13, which came out in 2001. Uh, so we had the old Essex design guide um, standards, which was a more of a minimum standard. Then you have the PP, uh, PPG 13, which is the maximum standard, really tying down those parking standards. And then you've got the MPPF, yeah, which is the more conservatory ranged sort of parking. So we've got those three um, development aspects all in one area of chapter 100, and that's what we use as a case study, rather than you know, picking all sin, picking Perkins or picking Stanford. We wanted to try and find the, the effect of those policy documents that were laid down by government in terms of what's the impact on the network, you know, and, and really looking at it of, from the point of view of impact on the network and, you know, how people move around with, within that settlement. So that's that's where we've got with the evidence base, and, and it is quite clear that the range of parking gives that degree of flexibility for not only developers but for us, but it really sets down a marker um, in the wording that says, if you want to go for a lower end of that range, you really have to demonstrate that it works. And you know, your point about the same parking, you know, for you know flat developments, there is a requirement to provide dedicated disabled parking within those flat development car park areas. And similar for you know, as you mentioned about you know new developments providing allocated parking as opposed to on plot parking. You know, the strategy's moving you know, towards we want the on plot parking provision because of the ability for disabled parking to be provided as close to the property as possible, not just allocated halfway down the road, but also for you know next generation cars, EVs, that if you've got an allocated on plot parking space, you can electrify it easier than allocated space. It's virtually impossible. Um, so there's there's this sort of shift in terms of what we're expecting developers to provide. Yeah, we're even going so far as to say a garage space, we're moving to the point where it's not it's not a viable parking space because no one's ever going to use it as such. So don't try and you know pull all over our eyes and say it's a parking space. We know that the first thing that someone's going to do when they move in, they're going to convert it to a habitable room. And there's not really much we can do once once that process goes through. So you know the only thing I'd say is that you know members should be um, confident that the evidence that we have obtained, not just for our own surveys, but also using um, the own government surveys as well, has really gone in depth into forming this parking standard to try and find a, a, route, a route through to try and find a, a practical approach. And you know, final point is, is that this isn't a fixed document. This is a fluid document that we're intending to change as things move along. Um, and if and if it's identified through new policy uh, that comes through that we need to change it, then we're not afraid to change it. But we do need to actually have a policy that we can refer to, that we can 
hopefully try to defend decisions um, at appeal because uh, unfortunately we're, we're, when we have to go to an appeal because of a, a parking situation it's very difficult for us to defend it because there isn't that established standard for us to, to refer to. Um, but I, if I refer to now with regards to the, to the strategy elements. Yeah, okay, thank you. So um, one of the things uh, raised was around <coughs> the, the, the policies of the future rate should move away from the using their vehicle. Um, and our, I don't believe that the document sets that out. There is a strong focus on encouraging mobile shift. That is the existing transport strategy within the file that the council has. It has been for the last few years to encourage mobile shift. And it is recognised that, um, that it is a good thing to encourage more people to use their car less frequently when they don't need to and to make opportunities to make journeys via other modes than the vehicle, especially short journeys. So we're, we're, it is also recognising the fact that car is an important part of the way people move and that sometimes using your car is more just than using other modes. Um, and so there, 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 there is a focus in terms of trying to find other ways to, to provide opportunities to not require car ownership, particularly around second and third cars, which studies show that they are used less uh, than the main car. Matt has picked up that, 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 that we are looking at making sure that there is parking provision provided for those vehicles. Um, the, the challenge becomes around, and if we picked up, you know, changing households who have three and four vehicles, and how we can um, provide opportunity to minimise the need for homes to need three or four cars. You have rightly pointed that in the past, opportunities have existed, people have continued to own more vehicles. Um, and part of that is because actually people have felt that the offer has not been there to allow them to make journeys by other means that isn't by a car. And this forms part of a wider, wider piece of work that as, as a team we are doing that looking at how you can make more communities better connected, how they can travel by their car. It, it is a real world reflection that, that car ownership is now starting to come decline across the country and that more young people are choosing not to use their car. That might not necessarily be reflected immediately in the new area, but that is a changing factor of the demographic. How people move is also changing. There is a greater move for people accessing types of um, mobility such as, well, let's say, um, to, 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 to make their journeys. There is at the highest level in this country, a desire to, to help make measures for people to be able to travel more reliably by bus. And you will recall in our last presentation this paper, I should present a paper on the um, bus improvement strategy, how um, people can um, walk and cycle more. I mean, I know it's very topical at the minute that the changes in the highway code uh, around walking and cycling and whether quite wrong. But there is, at, at another level, actually increased funding by government to make walking and cycling safer, better, more accessible. There is a, a, a general shift towards um, encouraging people to not have to rely on their car. And there are factors within this policy that try to help encourage people to be able to make journeys without that. But it doesn't move away from the fact and recognising that the car ownership is an important part of how people make transport choices. One of the other things that's picked up in here is around charges for certain types of permits, um, environmental charges. Or the number in this um, strategy are we saying that we will bring in these charges. What it is doing is giving us the opportunity to explore and look at that. And if that were to take place, there would be a, a significant consultation process that would need to take place. I mean, we, have to come through this process. It, it is giving us the opportunity and the flexibility to, to look at that in the future as opposed to saying we will bring these in. And, and you know, the, the for example, the one people we have the other policy, you know, first two parking permits, being all the small charge, third permits, 
um, within the environment, you know, it is again reflecting that, that there is a change at the highest level within government about needing to be more aware of emissions from vehicles. It is recognised that 50% of all emissions in Borough come from transport. Uh, and and whilst whilst these emissions are reducing, they and and, and our colleagues in, in our air quality team in the past have shown us that we are we are improving our air quality. Area. It is given the opportunity to look at okay, can there be an opportunity to not necessarily uh, to, to to look at uh, clean air zones or, or something of those nature, which are increasingly being introduced to just now. I don't know where to start, but we've done. Um, some of the things I've just heard, you know, the fact that you know, actually you are looking at other things out there, the problem being not in this document. So we're expected to have a look at this document, which is the same as the last document. We've got a vote on this document, not something you just said, which isn't in this. Um, you just said that you're not looking to raise charges on PPO, for example. This document says you are. This document says first two permits are currently free of charge, and the third is at a cost that is reviewed annually to encourage a reduction in car ownership across Thurrock in line with sustainability policies. The council will consider introducing a charge for the first and second permit. You can't say that we're not intending to do it, but it says clearly there that you are. Now, you can say it's a consultation document as much as you like, but we all know how this goes. Is that if we vote for this, well, later on down the line, I'll be going to introduce the charge that you voted for it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this, this, is, this is happening all the time. Now, I've lived in Farrow nearly all my life. There's only been one modal ship, and that's upward towards the college. Now, they, they may be reducing coverage in the city, perhaps, I, I grant you. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case in Farrow. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, the amount of young kids that are currently waiting to get their driving tests and lessons booked, they can't get this chocolate block for months and months and months. Projected to the car and ship is diminishing outside the centre. So I'm sorry, but it's all very well saying, well, we don't mean this, we don't mean that. Well, in that case, put it in the document if you don't mean it, say something else instead. You know, I, I don't know who else feels the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Yeah, I mean, I won't drill into the specifics. All we have to do is look back at the minutes from the, the meeting where we had this document before. You know, so um, because there's, there's been you know, by, by sort of our own, our own words, there's not been any sort of major changes to it. And there won't really be any major changes in our response, which um, was, I haven't got the minutes in front of me from that meeting, but um, pretty much a lot of things have been said tonight were said, I remember rightly, they, they were said at the, when this was first presented. So I think, um, you know, the fact it's been represented means that our sort of response gets represented, if you like. And, I, I agree with you, Chair, on the things you said. No, that's a good. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, uh, generally, I think what's, what's been said there, I mean, obviously, 1.1 is to uh, provide the proposed recommendations for some critical to have. Through the knee, um, just some, some bullet point recommendations. Uh, there was obviously also a huge dimension, I think, in terms of school, huge volume of work within the academic department. It wasn't just on the sort of the drop off uh, pick up point, it was the infrastructure. In terms of roundabout, also being on issue of schools. So that, that was good work, and I think that's a good move to go forward. I didn't think in terms of secondary schools, that, that was a really good piece of work. Um, I think that should, should be a standard. Um, in terms of new developments, I think we should be able to obviously visit a RP standard dramatically without offering some developers. Um, I know it's very easy to say that we increase the standard, but we increase the standard. Sometimes the developers will get nervous to say, look, we're not going to make enough profit. We can't offer as many times on a small amount of space. But um, as we saw with Spring House, you know, a little bit of the reduction here and there could increase the the space for you to solve uh, that problem. So I think the more business spaces, and I would say, are the standard. What that standard is, I don't know how far you go. Judge, but I think a standard that doesn't offer developers, but, but does, does obviously is possibly a big amount of public car. In terms of uh, the, the emissions from cars, one, one point I've made in the past, I'll make it again, is now I can't accept that cars do have 
much issue that if they assign the extra bidding as well as this, that the times that we're given very limited class by parking spaces would be still be there. So it's, it's an interesting one there. I think you're saying, yeah, we do want to have the digital front front with those cars are blue. But so how you overcome that, I don't know. I think we have to be so you shouldn't be. If, it, if petrol and diesel cars are different, that's something gears, yeah, okay, I get it, but don't think it is. So, yeah, in general, I think that's that, that for me would, would be enough. Plenty more vehicle spaces, an increase in standards, see if we can keep developments and where these vans can be parked in different so far. I think that should be achievable at a very little cost. That's it. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Chair. I actually had the uh, same to say a bit earlier, but I think you've got to have my hand up. <laughs> but it's, it's okay. Um, I was just going back to the, um, we've got to get away from this idea that um, proximity to a station should be uh, removing a uh, vehicle space, because numbers, frankly, don't show that. In my world, we have that much in Maryland. We have 23% uh, use no car. <coughs> we don't have a car show, and there's no train station there. But it's in South Chapman, where there's quite a bit, mostly it's in the train station, only 10% have no problem. I understand that. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly add to that. I've got an awful lot to say. I mean, this, the one I'm really critical of is the parking policy and strategy. Um, I don't have an awful lot to say regarding the parking enforcement strategy. I, I think that's I can certainly take that into it, and the parking design and development standards. I have no real issues with that one. I don't think anybody knows the documents. So, recommendation we go back to the October one, the well, new one, which we 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 we've only been given the the uh, two June proposed yeah. recommendations. Okay. Um, I would suggest that the Yet again, not back to parking policy and economic strategy document. So we do not agree that that is a suitable document for the performance. Um, but unless anybody has any objections uh, to, I would say the, the next two, parking enforcement strategy and the parking design and development standards. Sorry, Graham, just to confirm, is, it, is that implied? I think, is it 1.1 1 .1 or 44? Is that the only one implied? I thought that's the only one we're looking at. I think it's the whole thing, is it not? No, 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 it's I'm just the performance um, for reference for like, for us to look at. Oh, not so as I hope that. Fair enough. It's just that one. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's just 1.1. Yes. I think that was just well, like, it's the three documents we're looking at, though, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's right. It is, it is three documents, but um, I just want to learn to um, that sits with parking standards documents. So it is you, the comments you said do we go back oh, oh, well, to the three? So. Yeah, yeah. So again, I, I, I'm not happy to um, propose recommending that policy at all. Sorry, mate. Sure. Sorry. If, yes. Just, just because it, so I think the documents, the, the, the difficulty with documents is striking a balance between government guidance, active government, modal shift, white paper policy, mm. and then you come out to Farrak where it's a bit of a different place, yeah. people are up on par, there isn't the infrastructure yet in place, and yeah. everything else in the So really that's, that, that's the challenge right now, but it's about how do we start people on that journey to potentially explore more sustainable modes of transport. So that, that, that's really what sort of underpinning this. I think what we what we've been looking for from as officers was what areas would you say actually if you're not happy with this point to switch change this and I think Councillor Kelly made some, some points and then we'll close down about increasing visitor car parking spaces, etc. And but if for you chair, if I just come back to Councillor Kelly on that. If we said the standard needs to be increased, there's there's quite a few standards in there and it was it medium accessibility residential or lower accessibility residential. What's what's the areas that you're particularly concerned about? And that that's that's what we really want to take away and look at how well, we Well, in general, I mean, I'm not focused too much on the business aspect side of things, but in terms of residential, I think what I'd like to see, I mean, look, it's, it's very difficult to go through and go, well, I think this particular like that, just a general reasonable increase. And what that is, I don't know. 
But as I said, if, if you can overcome issues in place with parking and visitor parking, that's probably eight percent of your battle for it. Don't we don't want the property developers to get that? You know, developers got a small parcel of lands, they have to provide green uh, reasonable amount of green space, they have to provide a reasonable amount of parking, and they also have to build homes and respect them and property. So it's about trying to get that balance right. All we're saying at the moment is facing developments coming to us and we're looking at the planning and I and I like and that's just what we're going to do. So it just needs to be the more equity there are if possible, an increase in number of space. Well that is I generally don't know, but I'm hoping as as officers try to come up with that, hopefully is to come see less applications rejected. But I get what you're saying, we do need a document, and it's all doing well me saying it is. It doesn't apply to all government policy, so I also respect that that one saying is something like the council and it's also planning and let's try and increase things reasonably to see what happens. We just build the balances. Too far that way, we need to see how we can move it a little bit yeah, more pretty much and on this. And, and I think Matt will have made a point around it being. Because uh, essentially a live dock, you need something today, but we will need to be moving to change and hopefully we do in place and EVs are more, there's more EVs on the road and the interrupts in place, then we might be able to start imagining a bit further the other way, things more sustainable. But right now we're just saying, go, okay, I understand. So it's talking about this. And then just so I want to get clarity, so we've got 1.1, 1 .1, 154, so we need to vote on. Five of those, these half of the recommendations. Yeah, that's right. Are you looking for another vote? Well, just this one says, okay, why then? That one's just there. Yeah, can I just come in on one point, Chair, which is um, obviously there's a range of parking based on set of circumstances. Is it a case of within those set of circumstances that you feel the uplift of parking is required, or would you rather see a change in the Circumstances change. So, for example, high accessibility is defined as within one kilometre walking distance of a main one train station and within existing or proposed controlled parking zone. Would you like that to be reduced in terms of distance? You know, I'll give you an example for real world a one kilometre walking distance from Gray's main line train station is um, Manor Road in Gray's, which is you know, quite, quite a bit of distance. It's, it's yeah. near Broadway. Or, yeah. What, yeah. So would you would you like to see us to go back and investigate changing that and, and probably reducing it a little bit? Similarly, with um, where, where medium accessibility is defined as within one from a walking distance of the town centre or within 400 metres of a bus stop, that's got a minimum service of 20 minutes or less. You know, would you like us to say actually we want it to be 200 metres or we want the bus service to be um, you know 20 minutes or less in peak times, off peak and at weekends? You know, just to just to really drill down, you know, do you want us to tighten up or do you want numbers to be increased? I know you, you mentioned about um, visitor spaces, which is uh, across the board 0.25 per dwelling, regardless of accessibility. Did you want us to increase that to say half car parking space per dwelling? So a visitor space for every two properties? Yeah, right, so, so one every four. Well, uh, as I mentioned it before, Spring House, we, we do, I think. Look at that, so it's a blueprint, yeah. something like that. Yeah, I, think, I, think the, I think the Spring House one was initially they came in with um, a below standard visitor parking provision and they uplifted it to the 0.25 provision um, as a result of your request to go back and, and, and re investigate it. I, think. I thought it was a little borderline. Yeah, it, came it, back it, it was a shit 20 spaces. Yeah, it was, board, it was borderline on the respect that they were within the range. And the visitors parking was below the 0.25, and the additional parking space is probably up to the top of the range with the visitor parking provision um, provided within within what this standard would, would expect. Or well, well, for me personally, in a sense, the the range doesn't matter. Increase the numbers within the range. So I just need to see an increase. Mm. And you know, I'll be, I'll see what I've said. It's up to you guys now to come back. Yeah. To report, if you want. Yeah, I think that's, to put it to put it in context. Say, for example, we reduce the 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 the, the boundary area, say from a kilometre to five hundred metres. Yeah. Um, that effectively would mean uh, if a development. If you go on Broadway, like, if you go on Broadway, 
rather than the uh, developer come in between 0 and 1 spaces per unit, they come in between 1 and 1.5. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's a yeah. significant increase in the amount of parking provision. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, it's still not the you know, no. two spaces per unit, but it's, it's, it's still much more unit. reflective yeah. of the area. So, yeah, would you like us to, to investigate that option rather than see if we can uplift the, the numbers? If, if the size if that is going to, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I like that idea to mm. decrease, but at the same time, we also need to also focus on business basis to make sure that that's okay. enough. Yeah, and that's generally, like, uh, again, yeah. you know, Springhouse, Springhouse is another new organisation, mm. but we knew full well that they wanted to park at Springhouse Road, and that's going to have an impact on the shopping centre. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's not necessarily, mm. I like that, so reducing sounds good, but then at the same time increasing the business. And it's simply we could do the same for medium as well, so you see, so effectively it, it's when you look at it on, on a heat map, yeah, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. red zone would be high, the yellow would shrink, like that, yeah. they'd all shrink here, yeah. so, and then and then that gives us an opportunity that if um, there is a change, a step change in, in how society is going with regards to car ownership, it gives us the opportunity to expand it or contract it depending on the circumstances rather than trying to up or down numbers. Yeah, yeah, and you could, in theory, you could solve, you say it was a house with one two spaces, mm -hmm. you could solve it not by increasing the pressure on the ground price. Spaces, mm -hmm. but that would obviously be solely for large developments. But in general, yeah, it would be quite great. And that probably would be enough. Acknowledging the, the argument that we are a local so subject to government finance. So you can send this way. Okay, brilliant. And yeah, obviously you picked up comments on the score. Also, as I said, that was just really huge amount of work because that it wasn't just the drop off and pick up the sort of infrastructure and price points. No. Just really just, just to clarify it's a traffic signal or longer. Uh so we get to Twitch. Oh yeah, we, we get Twitch when you say around about <laughs> nice one. No, it was good work, so thank you. Yeah, okay, and now we still would like some um, timing up on this uh, emissions based stuff as well. It's, very, it's all very vague, and uh, yeah. if, if this is what you're going to be looking at, I want to see some, some proper detail in there a little bit and to who you are when you're targeting. But that, that needs to be you know, beefed up considerably. Um, okay, everybody happy with that? Yeah, yeah. thank you. So we can move to the recommendation on page 54. Uh, 1.1. All agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, that's the wrong one. It's that one dealt with then. So we then move on to item 8 integrated transport block package programs, highways, maintenance, allocation. Oh, sorry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sorry about that, Joe. The evil chair. Now you've spoken there for the recording. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll try and get through as quickly as we can. For a little bit. So, item eight: um, Highways Management Allocation Program. Pages 161 to 172. Can I ask Matt to introduce your report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so the ITV and maintenance um, program report sets out the allocations, uh, the grant allocations that will be received um, by the Council for the ITV um, capital program, £978,000 allocation, um, and also the allocation of £1.3 million for um, maintenance. Uh, these are grant funded allocations that have been calculated and provided to the Council for. Um, delivery of capital program and maintenance program for 2022-23. Um, the program, the, the, the paper um, identifies that the program will focus on uh, key areas where that funding will be um, allocated to deliver um, priority um, and data-led schemes. Um, the table at uh, 3.3 identifies those those key areas where the allocations um, are identified. Uh, across areas of road safety engineering, safety routes to school, uh, area intervention, um, EV charging, minor works, action transport, public rights away, and port and recycling. Um, and identifies how that um, allocation is to be um, is to be provided across those work areas. Um, the report also sets out that there is um, the ability for variations to be provided across the uh, program in year, 
um, by following delegating authority in consultation with um, through the portfolio holder in consultation with the director. Um, so if there is any need for sort of minor changes to be made in the year, then there is a delegated authority provided for um, portfolio holders to be able to undertake that. Um, both the capital block uh, program, ITB program, and the maintenance program are identified in um, the appendices that are attached, um, appendix A being the ITB program um, and the maintenance allocation um, and program identified in appendix B. Um, it is worth noting that appendix A still requires some data to be um, uh, collated, and, and that is accident police database accident data. Um, that enables um, uh, more information to be provided for that data led approach for um, parts of the program. Uh, so, areas of the program will be further updated once that data is provided. Um, and really, that, that, that is the, um, the kind of crux of the, of the report. Um, it identifies where we're looking to spend the, the funding. Um, you'll note that we have already. Um, identified policy approach um, for a number of these these areas in previous um, previous years. Uh, so yeah, so the, the the ITB program is set up there is nine hundred and seventy eight thousand. Um, I don't know if Peter wants to say any more in terms of the maintenance allocation of program and also any detail. Uh, otherwise, hand it back to you. I'm happy to um, add a bit if you want, Matt. So first of all, uh, LA Chair, LA Councillors, apologies, I can't be there tonight, but uh, childcare issues and what. Yeah. If so, the maintenance block allocation is based on the highways asset management policy. So it's a data led approach that we apply to look at the condition um, of the carriageway fire condition surveys. We then apply a sort of a scoring matrix to that, which looks at key cards to bus usage, HGV uses, and also reactive maintenance works. Um, we have to apply a data led approach to it because it ties into our submission for the HBEP funding, which were band free, which is top of band. That means we, we accrued full funding and we get an additional 277k, um, which takes us to 1.3 million. Um, we presented a list of the schemes in the appendix, and, and these are the schemes that were, were ranked high enough. There's some flexibility about what funding we apply to carriageways, lining, signing, signals. But we've got to maintain all assets. It's not just carriageways, unfortunately. So we've tried to apportion the budgets to try and target through life cycle planning the assets in the best way. I could talk all evening about maintenance, but I've got questions I'm happy to answer, but I'll probably draw a line there for now. Thank you very much. Right, any questions on this item? Right. I think it's all. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a Sunday for the books, sort of thing. Uh, right. Fair enough. In that case, well, thank you very much for your report, everybody. And uh, who's going to make the recommendations then? Recommendations on page 161 and 162. Are we all in agreement? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, item nine, as the thirteen East Tyson Access Update and Outline Business Case Proposal from pages one seven three to one eight two. Does Matt to introduce the report, please? Thanks, yeah. Um, so this report sets out the work that's been undertaken today um, by the council to produce an outline business case for um, the A13 East Basin Access um, Scheme proposal. Um, the, the report sets out that um, the history where the, the, back in 2018 there was um, an opportunity to um, uh, bid for funding, receive funding through the, um, uh, through the uh, major road network um, program. Council took that opportunity, um, <coughs> which enabled us to bring forward an outline business case for um, an access improvement scheme at the A126, A13, um, the MX uh, Previously, um, probably known as East Space and Slips for a, a period of time, now seen as East Space and Access. Um, the Council's had a, um, it, it, there's been a general ambition for probably about 25, 30 years to look at the problems caused around that part of the borough, um, access in and out of Lakeside, um, and, and the issues caused around um, West Durham when there are 
incidents and where there is heavy congestion, um, it does become um, very much an issue if there is no east facing access option um, from that location. So what we've done is taken the opportunity through the MRM process to bring forward the outline business case. Um, the business case is kind of 95, 99 percent um, finished off. We are um, we've got to a point where we've identified through um, an options assessment process a whole range of options that could be um, could be delivered. Uh, those have been sifted out for one reason or another, and then sort of um, identified down to the, the, the sort of um, premium option, which is identified within the um, the OVC and within the report. Um, the outline business case is, it is a very detailed document, so this is really obviously just a, a summary of where we've got to in terms of looking at those options, coming up with that scheme option, and that's identified there as, as the um, uh, option 1A, which is kind of within between 3.6 and 3.7 um, So the outline business case identifies the option, identifies the um, issues in terms of um, bringing forward the full business case and uh, everything that goes with delivering this scheme option. Um, it identifies the potential cost of the scheme, the risks involved in um, the cost that's been calculated and the delivery of that scheme. Um, it's all set out within a business case uh, to be submitted to DFT for their consideration. Um, if the council continues to um, uh, be seen as the scheme promoter for the East Space and Access scheme. However, we are in um, discussion collaboratively working with National Highways um, to identify their appetite and comfort to potentially become the scheme promoter um, and take responsibility for the scheme um, predominantly on the Strategic Road Network, which is National Highways um, infrastructure. Um, and we are looking at the opportunity to have those ongoing discussions to understand if National Highways have that appetite and ability to take the scheme on, become the scheme proposer, take on the, um, uh, the business case and submission for funding, and then actually look to deliver the scheme. Um, there have been various conversations with National Highways on this. We are um, we're, we're going to have um, detailed meeting with them at some point in February. Um, the meeting is not in dire at the moment, but there is the, it has been confirmed that we'll reconvene in February to uh, to discuss uh, to discuss this in more detail. And that really will be the opportunity to understand what appetite uh, national highways do have to take the scheme on, come to the and like I say, take responsibility for some of the um, the funding uh, for, the, for, the, for the funding of the scheme. Um, if that doesn't happen, part of the report identifies the risk that the council would then have to take if it was um, wanting to continue as scheme promoter, take the scheme forward for funding and delivery. Um, within the report, it, uh, the, the, the cost identified for the scheme um, is, is set out um, as, as the estimate identified at the moment um, with a required contribution from the scheme promoter. Um, that has been calculated using um, a whole range of different criteria um, and, a, and a, um, an amount of risk that's been added into um, business case. That amount of risk, um, I think, is well is calculated to 24%, um, which is a very high level of risk, but it's been increased as a result of some of the lessons learned from May 13 and widening and other major schemes that other local authorities have delivered. So the risk has, um, has, has been increased, so that we ask to DFT increases, um, but there is still a requirement for the scheme promoters to provide 15% of the um, identified cost. But there would also be the potential risk that if that identified and calculated cost was to increase, the scheme promoter is the, um, the body that would have to take on that risk and look to find any additional funding if the um, overall cost with above the 77.2. So obviously what we're looking to do is have a conversation with National Highways and, and um, work collaborative, collaboratively with them to identify um, a different option to, to bring that scheme forward. Uh, that will be um, identified with a more detailed, more um, idea of that conversation um, following the meeting in February. Uh, and like I say, that, that's kind of why the different recommendations are set out as um, that opportunity to have the conversation with National Highways, but also for members to understand that if that isn't forthcoming, 
then obviously there is a um, a funding requirement and potentially ongoing funding risk um, to deliver to. Yeah, thank you for your report. Uh, I think that is important to, to know right from the off exactly what you just said that this is still an ongoing conversation with National Highway, so we're not at any stage considering it at the moment. Uh, and just just for starters, the, the map we've got on option 1A, that, that also, I guess, is that a preliminary idea or is that something that's sort of more firm than not? Uh, well, it, it would require much more extensive detailed design okay. in, in terms of it is a design, you know, design set out that that is what it could Look like. Just to give a play of what yeah. you might look like. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Kerrin, then Councillor Kerrin. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this. Um, I think, to be honest with you, I mean, I, 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 I've been on this committee a long time and we, um, we've had many presentations on this. I think the fact that we need, um, I can't help but call it the East Face and Slips, that it's been, you know, when I've had briefing and everything, but um, I, I think actually, I can't really say too much about it until I know. What happens come February or March? Because I think this report is a completely different conversation, one way or the other, whether we are the scheme promoter or someone else is. And and at the moment, I'm not saying um, one way or the other is the best way, but I think um, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because I, I do like to go, as you know, I do like to go into detail on these things. But until it's sort of been a new municipal year, but I think. This should come back to us as soon as um, you know these discussions have happened because it is a completely different conversation. If it's if it's borough council that the scheme promoter, very different discussions if it's um, national highways. Yeah, and I think that's all I'm going to say on it at the moment. Yeah. So until we know that, and then once we know which way to go, and then we can we can have a massive treasury tax report where we really go into detail on it. But until then, I think I can't really. Thank you much. That's just. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, there were some very very good points raised by uh, Councillor Perry there. Um, I mean, yeah, looking looking at these this, this particular design, uh, the map's not too clear, but I am correct in thinking there. Uh, so that's any space that slips on both sides. So from South Down, you could access one side quite quickly, yeah. and then obviously you could exit there uh, as well, just across the road and down the valley the exit. And, and South End. So yeah, really good. Um, obviously incredibly disappointing it wasn't it wasn't done years ago. I think it was really restricted uh, the lakeside basin and really caused us some issues over in terms of traffic. Um, there is a little bit of sacrifice there. Obviously they managed a fantastic football pitch there, the lakeside sports ground, but that road uh, does cut into I think that is always in a inevitability that that was going to be. Well, obviously, in that case, I would like to see, you know, what we could do to uh, either move the pitch or, or replace it. I think the gas base is an absolutely fantastic facility. Um, I know it's relatively new. I think there's some, some funding there from FA, so it does need to be a real big push uh, to have that 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 sports between. I said that this is still sort of desperately needed. So, um, yeah, we're just going to try and find. Um, but yeah, really good, really exciting. I think the quicker the better, but yeah, it's just, if you can get us back to this once we have a rough idea, I do think a, a, a project this size here yeah, with the National Railways is certainly is to our preferred option. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. But uh, was there any thought in terms of the sports pitch, in terms of the business case? Yeah, there has been, and there's been a conversation, a um, number of conversations with, uh, with the, the guys that. Um, on the school sports pitch there about uh, uh, the implications of uh, different options and, and certainly the option that's been taken forward there and um, uh, how, we, how we can work with them in terms of identifying when this might happen, notice of you know what might actually be delivered and I think the, the guys there are probably beginning to understand all seasons of um, ability to keep that open rather than being kind of told like it's going to come in and disrupt without you know much prior. So we are um, uh, engaging with those guys and keeping them up to date in terms of uh, where we're at with this. And again, it does very much come back down to the conversation in February with like National Highways as to can this be taken forward and then kind of submitting through the MRM process and then um, understanding when a scheme might actually start to be constructed. 
and then we're obviously with them, not just with the um the sport ground but um a very detailed public engagement um process required to make everybody aware of the impact the reasoning is um sort of benefit to bringing forward a scheme so engaging with everybody that we thanks Karen. Yeah, just one question, which isn't going to massive details, but you know you're going to you're approaching national highways the scheme promoter. Is that because you don't want is that because Borough Council doesn't want to be the scheme promoter, or is it is it is it just part of the process that you have to approach others? Because what I'm thinking, if um, national highways didn't become a scheme promoter, would, would Borough Council be a inverted commas reluctant scheme promoter? Do you see what I'm trying to say there? Um, it's not like we're going to be, it's like we're going to try and get national highways to. What's the reason for approaching them? Maybe? It's two things really. It's, um, it's, it's the ability to find the funding um, and find the 15% that's required. Um, and national highways, through the, um, uh, the um, road investment strategy, have a part of funding that is more available to them for schemes of this nature. And clearly, they are. Um, they're delivering these kind of large level major project schemes on a very, very regular basis. So um, in terms of being a scheme promoter, the funding um, aspect is, is more regularly available for national highways and they deliver these schemes on a more regular basis. So, and it, and it is predominantly within the strategic road network, which is their network. So it kind of makes sense to bring that conversation forward. Probably uh, 15 or so years ago, that's kind of where the conversation started as a as a highways agency scheme um, scheme. So the highways agency scheme to be brought forward as uh, in space and six. Um, but the council took it upon themselves to bring forward a business case, bring forward the potential to gain this funding. Now we need to go back and um, continue the conversation with national highways as to whether there is that comfort and appetite to um, uh, become a scheme closer or at least take. Um, mm -hmm. awesome. I look forward to an update. I was certainly not certainly come back. Yes, yeah. thank you. Can I just add to that? Sorry, can I get that said? Is is part of that I've been involved in, in this version of the scheme since uh, the announcement was made by the central government to yeah. provide funding for it. Um, and I think it's important to recognise how much highways in them and then national highways have have changed. And become more angry with yeah. this scheme. Okay. Um, at, at the outset, I don't think they were particularly supported. I think it was in their two podcast group. And we were the, the team promoters, even the ones that made that submission yeah. to the Department of Transport at the time. Um, and they, there is a, another aspect that, that has to be recognised that because they are actually the, the asset owner of the strategic network. Uh, actually, there, there is, yeah, they did recognize the day when they had to that there is a legal duty, they may have to do this. So, yeah, but they, they, they won't be keen on doing that. But I think it should be recognized that actually in the past 18 months, there has been a substantial change in yes. how they have approached yeah. the scheme and want to take it forward. The fact that we're, we're at this position is a long way away from where, where we started. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just feel that um, it's about time to keep the scheme legislatively put off for many, many years now. And I think now is the time to get it moving because, you know, if we chuck it another 10, 15, 20 years down the line, it's just going to get more and more expensive. And, and especially very mild what we talked about today, what it does do, of course, is it improves journey times, cuts down traffic on the local roads, getting to Lakeside, uh, which by the very nature it reduces pollution and stuff. So, this is something I think we need to do. But also about this particular report, what I do like, it, it makes sometimes I think there's a, a temptation for officers to sort of put a bit of a gloss on the report to say, well, it's all lovely and rosy shiny. Yeah. This report actually is very clear on potential pitfalls uh, that may or may not sort of, uh, appear in the future. And I, I think that's good. I think, I think you go into something knowing that, that there is a potential risk that makes it better, we can make better decisions and we can ask probably better questions that you don't know, So. Oh, thank you for that. That's that's very good. Uh, any other questions or should we move on? I think that's it. So if we want to um through the recommendations on page 174, 1.1 1 .1 to 1.4. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Right, okay. 
we move on to item 10, which is the staff of the home interchange reports. Now, as we have noticed, there is an uh, uh, exempt appendix in the report. Now, we'll make a decision whether we are going to want to discuss that appendix or not, because we are going to discuss it in the exempt appendix. Um, yeah. I don't understand why I keep my little keep a better answer as it's reported. Can you give any ideas as to why the exemption exists for this paper? Well, good evening. Um, yeah, the, we're actually in the middle of a tender process, so any commercial information is, doesn't want to prejudice that. Sorry, but there is no commercial information well, here that's any different from the cabinet report. Again, I don't think that's the case. I think if there is some substantial differences, um, but the, 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 fact, the, fact, the fact remains that if we do want to discuss this, we will have a good attention. So, I'm, I'm not, I, I just feel really uncomfortable that this is this is exactly the same as an open cabinet report, apart from one thing on the addition. There is no commercial there's nothing I, I, I take your point councillor so, so I, I, I just feel that if we are going to discuss this I'll, I will remove myself out of this meeting because I'll just think it's inappropriate or we don't discuss this yeah I'm, I'm not fine that's, that's the option that's the and option that's, and that's my option to me so I'm, I'm not, not going discuss I'm not I, could, I just think that at the moment this is this is just I there is nothing commercially sensitive sitting in this report there is nothing well, unfortunately, that decision is ignored for me. Um, sadly, it, it's noted, and I, I understand your, your point of view, councillor. So I, I do understand that. However, uh, so we we can discuss the report, but we can't discuss the financials. Are you happy for that? Um, so if, if you're going to go ahead and sort of obviously turn off the recording of the teams, exclude the public, and I think I'm going to. Um, exclude myself from this item just because I, I don't want to be part of the, the secrecy. I think this needs to be out in the open. And if if this committee takes an opposite view, then I will withdraw and then, both then yeah, we'll both withdraw and then um, come back in when it's finished. But I just I'm not going. I don't want to be part of a secret discussion with this. I think this is something that should be out in the open for the public to see. So, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, Chair, I, I'm certainly yeah. with what you're saying. This is only to scrutiny, we do to scrutinise it. The, the technicality is from the actual board of campuses is not to discuss it. I, I, so I understand what you're saying. So we've got options. We either discuss it, or we might decide to discuss it between ourselves, but obviously, yeah, respectfully, on the basis of public or press, or, you know, I understand what you're saying. If you, you want to review yourselves, then uh, understand that. Uh, people are, are the the right to so, sorry, Graham. Um, yes. What, what was the, the options there? We either we discuss it. We either discuss the uh, the report without the financials, or we exclude and discuss the whole report. So the um, recommendation is that we withdraw the paper instead. So. Um, well, it, it seems to be the the uh, the two yeah. Labour councils don't want to discuss it. We don't discuss everything, yeah. uh, and I don't want to discuss everything that's being excluded. But unfortunately, I think if we want to discuss it, we will have to exclude it. So, the only thing is, there is an option to have to do the benefit of the right. 
Well, I, I think we'll go to the we'll go to the vote. Um, um, so I, I move that we exempt members of the press and public from this meeting. Putting an agreement. Exempt. Okay, so we will exempt members of the public and the press. Um, well, there's the option to defer this report. If um, the committee is happy with that and bring it back after the tender process is over, I mean, we, to be honest, we've got 15 minutes left of this meeting, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to be watching. Okay. Um, to further this report, if um, if it's also happy with that, so is that an option? Um, we just defer it to the next meeting. It's, it's the same time. No. I mean, obviously, look, we want to discuss it. Yeah, the professional advisors that we can't discuss it. Yeah. Um, can we just leave it to next meeting? Uh, Pete, would that be a substantive issue uh, bringing this back at the next meeting in the new municipal year? Or, or do we need to, to go to cabinet and report that? Oh, did you close it or something? Is this public or not? Is this debate public or is it not? You just asked me to leave and now you're in a public debate. Uh, yeah, we're not in exempt yet. We're not Okay, we, we don't appear to be getting an answer back from anybody. So, but this this report's not going to cabinet. This is a standing item on, right. on PTR, so it would come back in the new municipal year as well. So, if members um, would prefer to defer it to the next meeting, we could do that. If well, I think we're going to have the same issue though. Uh, so, I think no, we'll, we'll, we'll go in and we'll discuss it, and uh, we'll come back if there's time to, to carry on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, we have run out of time for the, the rest of the reports on this evening's agenda. So I propose that we uh, move them to the next PTR meeting in the new municipal year. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Is that a note to you, For the work program, we've got a few minutes to do that. Um, I think we're going to be bringing back the um, item 9, the A13 East Facing Access at some point. We'll do that sort of bit in. Yeah. After they've had that sort of meeting with the. Uh, yeah, the I think we'll be guided by the president that moment at the right time to get that right back. I think it's pretty much what we can really be looking for to back next year anyway. And, uh, no doubt there'll be uh, other items added by the officers before we get there. So, um, the A13 and Stanford be carrying on as a recurring item? Yes, um, that's what members agreed on um, yeah. earlier on in the year. Yeah, lovely, thank you. It might even be finished by the time we come back. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. In which case the time is now nine twenty seven and I bring this meeting close. Thank you. Thank you for standing in, Thank you. Thank you.